This morning, I want to pick up where we left off. We have a series afoot where as a church family, we are walking through the book of 2 Timothy in a series that I have entitled, Faithfully Fight to the Finish. And some people will say, why such an aggressive tact? Why such a continuous menu and recipe and serving of intensity? I've told you before, and and I will probably say, as long as God gives me the privilege of preaching, that most people don't realize just how intense genuine biblical Christianity is. Most people don't realize just what God's word really says. And to do so, and to become a student of his word, I promise you, will bring you to a place of understanding of the reality of spiritual warfare, warfare, the reality of the battles, and the reality for a need to embrace a call that is predominantly intense. Now, there are times where we are intensely loving, intensely joyful, intensely at peace. But make no mistake, God's word is very intentional and very specific. So, with a title like Faithfully Fight to the Finish, you might ask yourself, what what is the basis upon which this fight is taking place? Well, the Bible makes it very clear that we as his children, as God's children, will be persecuted, that we will suffer. Last week I shared the message as we walked through the first 11 verses of chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, and the message was entitled, What Do You Want This Christmas? And we saw the difference between what the world holds up and what the false teachers, those who the Bible tells us are working on behalf of the devil, those who hold up Bibles and point to crosses and lead churches, but lead them away from the truth of God's word. We ask the question, what do you want this Christmas? Do you want the world? Do you want the mess that Christ came into? Or do you want the Messiah who came and offered in truth and love himself? For all of us who choose Christ, I must tell you this morning that there will be persecution. This morning what I would like to do is take the next 45 minutes or so and I want to walk through three specific goals in God's word. I want to educate you. I want to enlighten you. And I want to engage you personally through the power and the truth of God's word educate you first and foremost to this topic of persecution. It's reality, it's necessity, and in large part it's definition. You see, God's word makes it very clear, as this morning we focus on just two verses. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. If you have your Bibles, and I encourage you to bring them, if you have them, I ask you to open up now and walk with me through these two verses, and we'll unpack them in large part using media to bring these truths to light. God's word says this, in fact, everyone, not some, not the real leaders in the church, not those that uh, wear the right clothes, not those that go to the right church, everyone who wants, again, I ask you, what do you want? Everyone who wants to live a godly life, not learn about but live a godly life. Godly there means reverence in action. Those who want to truly be lived out Christ-likeness in action. Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. First and foremost, you need to understand that if you're going to walk with the Lord, you will be persecuted. There's an everyone clause here. There's a universality. If you're not being persecuted, either God's a liar or maybe you're not walking with him. Now this doesn't mean that we're going to always be persecuted, that you live in perpetual toughness. But I think that what we find in the Western church is that the vast majority know K-N-O-W, know 
no and o oh, persecution because they do not know the king. They know religion. They know how to go to church. But they keep Christ and the call on their lives at arm's length. Here, God's word says that everyone who wants to live, not learn, a godly, the pursuit of righteousness, the pursuit of oneness with him, a godly life in Christ Jesus, not in the church, small c, but in Christ, will, affirmative, actually happens, no doubt, no loopholes, will be persecuted. So many of the false teachers that we learned about last week, those lovers of self and lovers of money and those that lift up the temptations of the world as treasures from the king, who lead people astray into a a life of self-centeredness and self-absorption under the umbrella of religion and even Christianity, are liars. They promise you health and wealth and worldly prosperity, and God's word says that if you will live a godly life, you will be persecuted. Why don't you ever hear them talking about that aspect of the truth? Why don't you ever see the guys on TV? Why doesn't Joel say to somebody, I'm sorry, man, you're in for a stretch of rough road. My word tells me that there are going to be those that are going to know persecution and suffering. I think it's you, buddy. You don't hear that. Because it doesn't sell well. Because people won't part with their money when you tell them the truth. I would say this to you. God's word promises that those that pursue godly living oneness with Christ will be persecuted. I think that the Western church, so many who claim to be Christians who are hypocrites and liars, false teachers and deceivers, not only won't they stand through the persecution, they're running away from the truth. They run from the truth, let alone when the trouble hits. They won't stand in the midst of truth and love. They will run after worldly treasures. Well, this morning, I want to show you a bit on persecution. And I want to do it with a global perspective. First, I want to show you a piece that's going to speak to the contrast between how we live here and what is shared so often in the church and what's happening around the world. I want to show you the top ten places where people are being persecuted because they are Christian. And I want you to note number two. And I want you to ask yourself, when we get to number two, how in the world could that not be number one? Take a look at this, and then we'll pick up on persecution. To most teenagers in America, persecution isn't a big part of their lives. This is our everyday life. But to many teenagers around the world, this is their everyday life. Turn my side to the crashing waves I cry in the night just to be saved Cause I need eyes to be my Have you ever been persecuted for your faith? You may have been harassed or discriminated against because of your beliefs Maybe laughed at or even rejected 
but chances are you haven't faced torture, arrest, beatings, persecution which still happens every day around our world. Today in our world, Christians are being persecuted to this extent daily. Within the communist country of North Korea, 70% of its population has no religious faith. Christians are imprisoned and tortured for their beliefs. In Saudi Arabia and Iran, Christians are captured and tortured by Islamic governments that work to all ends to keep them quiet. And although there are many differences and cultural separations, we also have more in common than we know. Many of these people being persecuted are the same age, have the same passions and concerns, and share the same faith in Jesus Christ as you and me. They are making a difference. Will you make a difference? Ellos torturaron a nuestro pastor y al resto de la iglesia. Después vinieron y los mataron. Se nos dijeron que no podíamos orar ni alabar al Señor. ¿Cómo <tose> Yo les dije, si me matan, voy a estar con Jesús. Ustedes me quieren matar o me quieren dejar vivir, no importa, yo gano. Each year, Open Doors assembles the World Watch List to focus the world's attention on places where religious freedom is limited, where persecution occurs. The list includes the 50 most oppressive places in the world for Christians to live. The purpose is to enable followers of Jesus around the world to unite in prayer, advocacy, assistance, and encouragement for suffering believers. Let me tell you about the top 10 countries on the World Watch List for 2010. Number 10, Uzbekistan. Here it is illegal to tell people about Jesus or import religious material. Media campaigns against Christians are widespread and many are forced to leave their homes due to threats by their communities. Number 9, Laos. Christians here are under strict government surveillance. Communities apply severe pressure to anyone who abandons the worship of evil spirits. Number eight, Mauritania. Converting to Christianity is a forbidden here. The government is increasing the pressure on Christians through threats of imprisonment or death. They're seeking to eliminate the gospel's presence and impact. Number seven, Yemen. Islam is the state religion. No one is allowed to convert from this religion. Disobeying this law brings severe opposition and possible death from authorities and extremists. Number six, Afghanistan. Christians must remain hidden here. 
If they are discovered, they face the loss of their family, home, and job. They are beaten, imprisoned, and often killed. Number five, Maldives. All citizens must embrace Islam. If anyone converts to another religion, they face the loss of citizenship. The government believes this severe law promotes national unity and retains their control on these islands. This is the least evangelized country in the world. Number four, Somalia. Islam is the state religion here as well. There is no religious freedom. Christians have been kidnapped, raped, and killed in 2009. Converts who are allowed to live become family outcasts and practice their faith in secret under extremely dangerous conditions. Number three, Saudi Arabia. Non-Muslim public worship is forbidden. Disobedience brings arrest, flogging, and deportation. Christians risk death threats and honor killings. Number two, Iran. According to a new law, converts to Christianity face a mandatory death sentence. House churches are monitored by secret police, and members are often arrested, questioned, and beaten. Number one, North Korea. Everyone is required to worship the leaders, Kim Jong-il and his father. The regime believes their power will collapse if they fail to stop the spread of Christianity. When Christians are discovered, they are sent to deadly labor camps or secretly executed. Praise God for the people at Voice of the Martyrs. It's a ministry that's drawing attention to the world, to what's happening to those who are being persecuted. And so I ask you, from the standpoint of understanding, what is persecution? We use the word, but I venture to say in large part we don't truly understand the word. And here's where I've got to go from preaching to meddling. Because I think we tend to use that word an awful lot in the church in ways that don't truly represent biblical persecution. Let me take you to Jesus. Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 and 11. Jesus now speaking. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Say, yeah, that's me. Boy, I'm in a real tough stretch of road. Let's finish his sentence. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. Is the tough time that we tend to call persecution the result exclusively of our pursuit of righteousness? Is it only because of my desire to be more Christ-like that I am dealing with this struggle? this persecution. Jesus goes on, he says, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you. Don't miss the last three words. Because of me are the troubles and the travails that we so quickly call persecution coming because of our pursuit of Christ's likeness? Is it in our life because of Jesus? I have to tell you, I see an awful lot of professed persecution that in reality is discipline from God. Struggles that are coming not because of our pursuit for Christ, but because of our love of self our pursuit of sinful desires. The very things that the false teachers tend to ignite in us, telling us that it's okay. I told you last week, Joyce Myers, one of the prosperity preachers, has coming out with a book this spring. Eat the cookie and buy the shoes. Give yourself permission to lighten up. I I, I missed that title in 2 Timothy. I, I didn't get that as we walk through Second Peter. I'm not hearing that from Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. 
And yet this is what the world, under the umbrella of Christianity, is being fed. This is what we're being told to watch out for. I ask you, when you think of yourself as being persecuted, might you be getting disciplined instead? I ask that of myself. I have to tell you, when I watched that video that I just shared, I was so humbled. I was broken. Do you know that the eighth most persecuted country in the world, the eighth most difficult place to live as a Christian, is a country I didn't even know existed? I heard the name, and I don't think I've ever heard the name of that country before. And I think, wow. Boy, I have a lot to learn. I have some tenderizing that needs to happen in my heart, some caring that goes out beyond my local cocoon. Oops. If you can relate, let us have an appreciation for true persecution and let us remember that God is saying that everyone who wants, really wants, to live, not learn about, a godly, Reverence in action, life in Christ, not just the church, will be guaranteed from above, persecuted. That's God's truth. That's his word to us. I ask you to embrace truth and love. I want to introduce you now. This is the enlightenment part. I want to introduce you to Shafia. I want you to gain an appreciation for one life, just one life, but what life is like in Pakistan if you truly want to walk with the king. And I do this to sensitize our heart. We get so caught up in our cultural Christianity, in our easy way of life. We lose sight of the fact That this is God's word. It is truth. And it is being lived out around the world. And so when you hear all these pulpit pimps telling you that it's all about you and your best life can be now and you ought to eat the cookies and buy the shoes, or those that are deceiving and manipulating for their own wealth and gathering their own stuff, you need to know that that goes 180 degrees against God's call in our lives. He says that he will provide love, joy, peace, patience, the other attributes of the fruit of the Spirit. But they will come in an environment of suffering, of cross-carrying, selfless servitude. And we will be blessed in that, not around it or on the other side of it. We are blessed as we are being used. Believe it or not, where persecution does exist, those who genuinely love the Lord will tell you and more importantly show you that the greater the persecution, the greater the blessing. I take you back to Daniel in the lion's den, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, the giants of the faith, Joshua, Paul, Timothy, Silas, You're not going to find a way around persecution if you walk through God's word. What you'll find is the promise of living large in the midst of it with the king. I was inspired by Shafia in Pakistan. I pray she'll speak to your heart too. Facing a lot of problems uh, here in Pakistan. Uh, we are uh, 2.5% here, and there's a lot of Muslims, 98% Muslims. There are about 17% Muslims, fundamental organizations, uh, Taliban, Al Qaeda, and many different, many other uh, organizations. Those who are making problems for Christians. They are beating, they are kidnapping, they are raping, they are burning, they are killing. All kind of persecution. 
Christians are facing due to their faith in Christ. Up to now, uh, 43 Christians killed in different uh, incidents. Uh, some are uh, killed in Gojra incident. There was a Bhavalpur incident. It was attacked in, uh, uh, in Bhavalpur after 9-11. Then there was an attack on Christian Mari School. There were some people who were killed. There was an attack on uh, Tax Law Mission uh, School. So there are, there are about 43 people who were killed. Because I'm a Christian, I face huge persecution. The Muslims kidnapped me, took me away and locked me in a room. They raped me, they beat me also. They were forcing me to convert to Islam. When I got the chance, when they locked my room, I was praying to Jesus Christ, please release me from this place. My brother was very good and he was a kind of leader in this village because when Christian girls were going to attend the church, Muslim boys were fooling around with the girls. It was Palm Sunday. The Muslims were saying, you can't have a prayer service today. But my brother said, I will give my life, but we will make sure that there will be a Sunday service. So they brought all of the girls and the Christian people and my brother said, okay, go ahead, we are going to have a prayer service. But Muslims came and they beat pastor's wife also and pastor's sons also and they beat my brother also. My brother stood up against the Muslims and later on they took my brother away and they killed him. When my brother was here, in this world, we were very comfortable. No one was looking at us. The Muslims weren't looking at us. He was taking good care of us. And may God give him a good place in heaven. After him, we are facing a lot of problems. When he died, one of the Muslims came to me and was telling me, we killed your brother. We can kill your other brother also. So after that, life was hard. They kidnapped me and were forcing me to convert to Islam. They were thinking that I might take revenge for the murder of my brother. That's why they were forcing me to convert to Islam. They took me, they beat me and they raped me. I was going with my mother and brother to visit some relatives. While on the road, two men came on a motorbike. They had a pistol in their hands. They fired in the air and told my mother and brother to get down in the field. They took me forcefully on the motorbike. It's an everyday story, like uh, Safiya's story. There's a lot of abductions, there's a lot of rapes, and uh, there's a lot of uh, force uh, for the conversion. The, the religion is saying that invite people towards Islam. So they're inviting every day. And that is not just invitation, they're forcing us. They're forcing Christians to be converted. The most important issue we're dealing with, that is uh, blasphemy. The blasphemy law is to disgrace Quran or to disgrace uh, uh, the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Muslims, they are using that law as a tool. Whenever they have their personal revenge, they have personal uh, issues, property dispute, money dispute, every dispute, they just say that uh, he, uh, he disgraced Quran or Prophet. Because of the murder of my brother, we needed money to fight his case in the court. We had no money, 
scraps of wheat took a loan from the landlords, but that was not enough. Then my family, my brothers and sisters, everybody started working in the brick kiln. Because brick kiln owners also give loans. So we had some loans from him and then we started working in the brick kilns and we are still working. There's a lot of people uh, working, uh, not on the brick kiln, but the people, those are in bondage. I'll say that around about 40% people are working in the, these kind of, kind of uh, situation. It's a very tough life on the brick kiln. You have to work all day making bricks, when if sometimes you make less bricks, they beat you up. Finally, we were released from the brick kiln because VOM paid our debt. I have great peace in my heart now because I am with Jesus. I want that the young people, those who are working in the brick kilns in my village, they should also pray and come to Jesus. They will feel peace also. I am teaching Bible and giving the girls sewing skills so they can also feel peace in their lives. The most uh, important thing is to pray for the Christian community in Pakistan. God bless them, God give them strength, God give, uh, God encourage them uh, to face all these kind of persecution. And uh, be thankful and be happy during the persecution also. I'll say to the young girls, pray, pray and pray. Read the word, stay close to Jesus Christ. You can pray with your family, with your brothers and sisters. Stay close together. Just pray. I pray for my guests, those who came from abroad. May God bless them. They are helping us and give them strength and encouragement so they can help other people also. I also pray for those who are sick and in trouble. May God heal them and take their worries. And once again, I want to pray for our guests. May God bless them and save them and stay with them in their journeys. Shafia is praying for us. Why don't you get a load of that? Her brother martyred because on Palm Sunday he said, I will give my life that there will be a prayer service. In the Western church, we can't get people to come to church on time. We struggle to fill nurseries and child care and pour into others. Those who are being persecuted are laying down their lives, that others would simply have the opportunity to hear the truth. Shafia would pray for us, thanking God for us. God's word continues. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Verse 13, while evil men and imposters will go from bad to worse. Say, Pastor Jeff, how could that possibly go from bad to worse? Well, I want to continue to enlighten you in a way that I pray begins to engage you. For you see, it is far worse, and so long as these are video clips and truths that we become aware of, they still remain at arm's length. Most of you know that there's a pastor, a contemporary pastor that I think very highly of. His name is Francis Chan. 
He's written a couple of books that have had a huge impact on my life, and we as a church family have had a little bit of a walk with him through his ministry as he's impacted ours. Some of you know that uh, he left his church about uh, four months ago, five months ago. There's a lot of speculation in the church world as to why. They go, oh, he must have something going on. There must be skeletons in the closet. Probably some financial stuff. His first book is called Crazy Love, a wild, crazy success in Christian book writing circles. Most people don't know that he's turned over 100% of the proceeds from that book to the ministry. Draws not a nickel from the sale of that book. And he tells the story that he and his wife are often confronted by people who claim to be Christians, who tell him he's crazy, that that was stupid, that he never should have done that. How could he? And he said, how could you read my book and ask me that question? Either you didn't mean it where it impacted you, or you didn't get to know me as the author. I want to shed light again, on persecution in the church. I want this to get real with us. Whether you're here in the building or watching via media, you need to understand what's happening around the world and in a culture that is so quick to check off church activities and so slow to surrender. Where we're looking at our schedule and all the things we've got to do and we tell people like me that we ought to be pleased with what we're getting out of somebody's life as our focus is more on learning than living, on checking off activities instead of surrendering all of who we are to Christ. God's word says, evil men and imposters will go from bad to worse. Francis Chan got a look at that, and it impacted his life. I just want to share three minutes of his perspective with you. For the last year, I've been uh, been hearing about the persecution of the pastors and the missionaries and just the Christians in general in, uh, in India and in the Orissa area. And my heart's been stirred toward it. But just recently I saw a video of some of the persecution and I just wasn't ready for it. I thought I understood what was going on over there and then I saw the video and I wanted to throw up when I was done watching it. It it caused me to question everything in my life. I mean, literally everything. Everything about me, everything about church. I mean, when I saw these men of God literally being beaten, I've never seen someone being beaten to death. I've never seen people getting mobbed and literally, I'm not sure that I've even seen death in in, in a violent manner. And and when it's the real thing, it it just... uh, it just makes you sick. You, 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 you knew what was going on, but to see it, it, it just, uh, it, it, I, I can't explain it. It made me really sick to think of people that may lift me up because I have a gift of communication or, or some other Christian who has an ability to sing or play an instrument and how we lift these people up as our heroes or great writers or when these are the ones that uh, and their lives look like Christ and see when we make a, a popular author or speaker our hero then it's easy to go oh yeah I want to become like him but then when we look at these martyrs and these people who really have died for the gospel. If we lift them up to be heroes, we have to constantly ask ourselves the question, do I want to be that? When I talk to the people in India that are going through it, they're not asking for money. They're just asking that 
we remember them, that we would pray for them because they're saying many people are converting out of Christianity out of fear because people are saying, look, if you get out of Christianity, we won't do this to you. And so people are scared and, and so they're saying, would you just pray for us for courage? And I don't know what emotions go through your mind when you see some of these images. But what they're asking for is, would you channel that toward prayer for us? I mean, you've listened to me speak for three or four minutes. Could you spend the next three or four minutes praying for our brothers and sisters in India, seriously praying for them? I want to ask you to pray with me. Father, we come to you now, remembering not just our brothers and sisters in India, Pakistan, North Korea, China. We remember also those, Lord, who are being persecuted here in the United States, albeit rare, those truth tellers who are maligned and viciously called names, whose ministries are undermined by both the wolves within and the charlatans on the outside. Lord, we pray that you will strengthen our brothers and sisters whose blood is serving as the seeds of the church, whose blood is serving as the seeds of the church. Lord, sensitize us, not because of the time of year, but because of the truth that is your word. Because on this day, as we continue to walk through 2 Timothy, and hear you speak to us, that you would say to a people who are so, so insulated from some of the greatest struggles around the world, that even those of us who are in our size of struggles have such opulence and comfort compared to those who have machetes put across their throat because they say they love you. Those whose families are tortured because they will not denounce you. Those whose faith costs them their lives. Lord, sensitize our hearts that as true brothers and sisters, that we will remember them in prayer, that we will lift them up, that we will give of our time, our talents, and our treasures to be used of you to make a difference as you promised in Acts 1-8, locally, regionally, and around the world. Father, I pray that you'll break our hearts with the things that break your heart. I pray that like Francis, these truths will rock us and just absolutely shake us to our core. And I ask this on behalf of a people that thank you for enlightening us to the truth and love. In Jesus' name, amen. You say, Pastor Jeff, where do you possibly go from there? Back to God's word. The second half of verse 13 says this. Let me give you the two verses put together. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil men and imposters, those leading people astray, not just the pagan haters, but the phony Christians who are leading people down a road of self and sin to Satan's den for all of eternity. He said, evil men and imposters will go from bad to worse, Last four words, deceiving and being deceived. I want you to know that we have been told that we as true adopted children of God should expect, nay, look for the guarantee of persecution. All the while, there are deceivers who are deceiving people under the roofs of church buildings, telling them that it's all about them and that you don't have to go this far and this call to a zealous walk with the king is overboard and it's lies. They are, per God's word, deceiving and being deceived. 
I would tell you that sadly in far too many churches in our culture, under all kinds of names, be they Catholic or Protestant, be they Southern Baptist or something else, where it's not about Christ and there's not a willingness to be persecuted and there's the false claim of getting persecuted when in reality they're just being disciplined. I want to show you some pictures that I think tell the story of these deceivers. They're the peacocks that hang out together under steeples, carrying Bibles, but really they're peacocks. It's all about the show. Don't you love hanging out together? This is the cocooning that happens under the name of Christianity. Where there's, there's no love for Christ. There's no cross-carrying, truth-telling, willing to be a servant who washes feet. No, it's just a nice, clean gathering of wee peacocks. The next picture shows you what happens most of the time. It's peacocks showing their feathers to other peacocks. It's about how things look and the priming and the propping. We talked last week about those who want the poisonous pampering at Christmas and not the Christ of Christmas who says, I have a cross for you to carry and persecution and suffering that will come as a blessing as we walk together through this life. Those who are evil and going from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived are the peacocks oftentimes who want to show feathers and be looked at. When, as we've talked before at the bridge, we've been called to be eagles. Eagles. And I have to draw your attention to the fact that sadly there are also eagles who spend their time with other eagles, but they stay down on the ground. Eagles weren't meant to hang out on the ground. No. Eagles were made to soar. And I show you an eagle mid-flight, one of the most majestic views in all the world that God has given us in large part. To recognize it's not enough to hang out with eagles, you need to soar. And I show you the last picture, which serves as our ministry logo for overcomers. God's word says that if you soar with the king, you will be persecuted. Your feathers will be ruffled, but you will soar no matter what. God's word says that if you want to walk through this life in a godly way in Christ, you will be persecuted. I'm begging you as Bridge family members, to step up to the plate and answer the call on your life no matter what. No matter what. And I recognize in a church family, statements such as that and pressure applied in that way to be who God has called you to be may in fact thin a herd. God's word says that there will be goats in amongst the sheep, weeds in amongst the wheat. And we are to be who he's called us to be. And that includes being persecuted and suffering for him. Not for selfish gain, not for religious reasons, not for ritual or anything else, but in pursuit of him. I want to close this morning asking you to take a time of prayer and or contemplation. God's word In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evil men and imposters in the church will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. I want to share with you a message shared with graduating seminarians from where our family was trained. I want you to listen to Dr. Moeller speak to those like us, the Pearsons, who were leaving to come to people like you. 
And his message was to those of us who were leaving the seminary. But make no mistake, it was for us to bring it to those of you that we would be with in church family. And every syllable of what he said to those like me is in line with God's word to people like you. And the real key, as we close out 2010 and get ready to look into 2011, is that we live dangerously together in Christ, for Christ, no matter what. I ask you to pray and contemplate these two little verses that are chock full of promise and power in Jesus' name. And we'll pray together after this. This isn't safe. This isn't a safe place. This isn't a safe calling. This isn't a safe world. This isn't a safe hour. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of the darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. God has enemies. If we conceive of the Christian ministry as a profession, we will be seeking safety. Because the logic of a profession is that we have earned the right to be respected in holding our profession. We have earned the right for the respect of a community, of the culture at large, of the society. Professionals aren't supposed to be in danger. You're supposed to be able to put the certificates on the wall show your credentials to the world and go about your business for the martyrs we draw our confidence in the knowledge that this is deadly dangerous business for time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David and Samuel and the prophets who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight, women received back their dead by resurrection and others were tortured, not accepting their release so that they may obtain a greater, better resurrection And others experienced mockings and scourgings, yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins, in goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated. Men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. Is that what we're supposed to aspire to? These are held up as those whose faithfulness is to be our guide and our example. Do we really believe that we deserve better than did they? There's a natural temptation to seek safety. We should expect that the risk will be greatest where the gospel is breaking through the darkness. That's where we should expect the fight to be the most intense the danger to be the greatest. What if our default was to go rather than to stay? To take the risk rather than to play it safe? To sacrifice? What if our default was to say now and not later? What if this year we were determined to do something where we will take some risk and do something dangerous for the glory of God. The greatest danger might be that something will take possession of us even as we find ourselves in such a field. I invite you to go. To find a place that's dangerous and be dangerous. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. 
that invigorated and shaped an entire generation that was willing to go and if necessary to die what about our generation your generation we will be dangerous this ought to be the year of living dangerously it ought to begin now not later it ought to begin here not just there we need to see the danger we need to embrace the danger but brothers and sisters we need to be the danger if gathered here in this place are so many as appears committed to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ then this is a dangerous place because the forces of evil and darkness the enemies of the gospel have more than met their match not because of who we are but because of who Christ is not because we have any tactical skill but because we follow a Lord who's going to vindicate his gospel we need to be embarrassed not to be dangerous we need to be embarrassed not to seek the right kind of danger and risk the right kind of danger We need to be embarrassed to fear that one day we might retire in security and say, I supported dangerous people. I knew some dangerous people. We need to be a dangerous people. And let us be accursed if on that day, a far greater day than this, we have to admit that we were not there when things got dangerous. The last verse that Dr. Muller referenced that was difficult to read is Romans 10, 14, in which God's word says, How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. I close this morning. I close 2010 pleading with you to be one who will bring the good news. Ones that will answer God's call on your life no matter what that you will be eagles who soar for our Lord and who plan to come home with the most ruffled of all feathers because you understand that all, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. I offer you with our last service for 2010 the most inspirational verse that God gave me at the beginning of 2010. Jeremiah 17, 7 says that blessed are those who trust in the Lord. My emphasis added, no matter what, God's word picks back up. Blessed is he whose faith or trust is the Lord. There is no pile of persecution that will sway one who holds to Christ as king, no matter what. May we go into 2011, as my adopted mother Shirley used to say, bring it on. Here we come, Satan. God's people are on offense 
And we will serve our king in the midst of persecution and suffering no matter what. Because God said so, that settles it. And we are blessed to serve the king. Would you pray with me? Oh Lord, thank you so much for the call on our lives to be your instruments of love and truth and hope. Father, I pray that you will use us no matter what. No matter what. That we would hear your voice say to us at our time, which will come, well done, faithful servant. Lord, let us embrace what's on my sweatshirt. That it not be just a fashion statement, but an identifying DNA marker of who we are in Christ. That we are doulos, blessed slaves. Pour us out. Empty us for you. Lord, grab our hearts when we tend to look at our calendar, our wallets, our other areas of life that tend to come in between you and us. Lord, may you forever reign first and foremost in every way, shape, and form in our lives. May all of our time, our talents, and our treasures be yours. Oh, the Christ that would give us the cake that you continue to love us as we offer back the crumbs. Lord, let us be yours no matter what. Let us live dangerously for the king. Let us put everything at stake for you as adopted sinners who deserve hell and through your grace and your mercy have been offered eternity with you. We love you. I pray, Lord, make us humbly courageous in Christ, no matter what. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.